Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. We're at the Jaguar plant in Browns Lane, Coventry. Jaguar, of course, one of the most illustrious and charismatic names in the industry, a name we associate with things like good design and performance and racing success. Now, for most of the 80s, Jaguar were fiercely independent and flourished. But just five months ago, they were bought by Ford for £1.6 billion. For that, Ford acquired a sizable manufacturing plant, but part at least of what they paid for was the Jaguar legend. We're here really to see what plans Ford have for this famous British company and to look at some of the cars that helped to create that legend. Jaguars haven't always had an impeccable image. All the villains used them as getaway cars in old TV shows, but they always had a certain style. The creator of that style was one William Lyons. In the 20s, his Swallow Sidecar Company progressed to building coach built luxury versions of popular Austin, Wolseley and Standard saloons. Standard provided the mechanics for the first car he developed himself in 1931. Called the SS1, this version is kept in Coventry by the Museum of British Road Transport. It has classic 30s saloon car looks, but the performance was distinctly timid from the 53 brake horsepower, 2 litre standard engine. For real performance, buyers had to wait until the mid-30s. Lyons was joined by a very talented engineer called Bill Haynes, and he had the inspired idea of adopting the name Jaguar for all his models, a name filled with a sense of lithe and muscular power. And in 1935, they produced the first version of this lovely car, the Jaguar SS100. They'd rebuilt the basic standard engine, to produce 104 brake horsepower, so it had a very good power to weight ratio, and it could do a genuine 100 miles an hour. But above all, it had style, immense good looks. Add to that the very good performance and the very competitive price, you got all the basic ingredients of the new Jaguar image. In 1948, Jaguar produced another car which immediately captured public attention and confirmed their ability to build really fine sports cars. It was this car, the XK120, produced on an experimental basis, really, for the 1948 Motor Show, the first one after the war, but the demand was so great on both sides of the Atlantic, they had to go into full-scale production. Once again, it was Lyons' genius as a stylist that really played a major part in this car's phenomenal success. In fact, the low, wide body with these long, curving, fed-in wings established a sort of uh, modern post-war look straight away. But the engine was just as revolutionary, because they'd had the courage to give this straight-six 3.4 litre engine, a double overhead camshaft in the manner of Bentley and Bugatti and Alfa Romeo. It was way ahead of most of its rivals. In fact, only the most expensive cars of the day were as sophisticated, most powerful as the XK120. The car was so fast the company started competing in motorsports events and did well enough to prompt a full blooded racing version. Three of these C-types were entered for Le Mans in 1951. Two retired, but the remaining car, driven by Peter Whitehead and Peter Walker, became the first British car to win at Le Mans since the 30s. The effect on Jaguar's prestige and sales was enormous. With a more advanced body shape, the car became the D-type, which scored a remarkable trio of victories at Le Mans in 1955, 56 and 57, taking the less than five out of the top six places in that year. Of course, all this racing activity helped to publicise Lyons' luxury saloons. This is the Mark 7, launched in 1950. Very much a saloon development of the XK120. Very much more restrained in styling, of course. A trifle sedate, perhaps. This one actually weighs two tonnes. But it had the XK120 engine, so it had a good performance. It had all the luxury touches, like worn-up veneer, for example, on the instrument panel and the door cappings. This particular car was owned by the Queen Mother herself, so it had a number of special features, and some of them, like this uh, full-width windscreen, were built into subsequent models. Something a little more compact appeared in 1956. The 2.4 was the first car to establish Jaguar as a manufacturer of some scale, although the narrow rear track could throw a wobbly on tight bends. By the time the Mark II version appeared, in 1959, it had a stiffer chassis, more style and better brakes. It also had an interior more in keeping with Jaguar's larger saloons. The car was almost unbeatable 
in saloon car races of the early 60s. Although this prototype, called cryptically E2A, was meant for racing, its career was somewhat eclipsed by its production cousin. The E-Type had little legroom and rather dubious brakes, but its looks and performance left the much more expensive exotic cars of its era running a rather poor second. It became the car of the decade, the most glamorous and eye-catching object with which to adorn your personality. Much of Jaguar's recent history has been tied to the fortunes of this car, the XJ6. They started work on it in 1964 and eventually launched it to the public at the Motor Show in 1968. It was immediately acclaimed by many as the best and most refined car that Jaguar had ever produced. A quiet, comfortable, luxury saloon car with the handling and performance of a sports car. With growing success, they made and marketed basically this car, with modifications of course, for the next 20 years. It was certainly the XJ6 that lifted Jaguar into the realm of the world-class luxury saloon car maker. It was in production for so long because Jaguar became absorbed into British Leyland and was starved of the necessary investment to produce new models. Indeed, Jaguar's very survival was in doubt. Everything changed in the 80s when the company became independent again under John Egan. The XJ6 replacement was launched in 1986 and the company re-entered motor racing. They had great success with wins both at Le Mans and Daytona. But now that they're part of a large organisation again, will the nightmare years of the 70s be repeated? It's a chalk and cheese situation between the Leyland management and Ford management. Ford are being extremely careful to protect what they see as, as the, the, the flower, the, the gem that they have in Jaguar. Um, I've seen nothing yet that says that they will do anything at all other than support what we're trying to do. Uh, I feel very comfortable about it now, and I guess I was amongst one of those who remembered the past better than most. Ford Cash can also help Jaguar to modernise its rather inefficient and labour-intensive methods of car assembly. Their resources should help Jaguar meet future emissions and safety standards. What about broadening Jaguar's model range? We'll be able to make the sort of motor cars that we and our customers have been looking to make for some considerable time now. Really, I suppose, a competitor to the BMW 5 Series. That, that sort of range of motor car, uh, a little, little cheaper than our present car, perhaps a little sportier. But there are fears that Brown's Lane, with all its traditional skills, may not remain intact. And with Sir John Egan now gone, are the Ford source management teams quite as committed to the Coventry plant? The centre of operations for Jaguar has been here for many years. We would like it to stay here. Of course, we have to bring the, the level of efficiency and the uh, level of productivity up to world standards because that's the only way we can compete for the future. Uh, Jaguar today makes about 50,000 cars a year, so it's relatively small on a world scale. I think the, the brand is much stronger than that, potentially, and that's the potential that, uh, with the resources of Ford behind us at Jaguar, uh, that's the opportunity that we would like to capitalize on and, and see the company grow substantially from its present size.